or Bibles, it's like sending soldiers to the battle without, without ammunition. And it's, uh, it's a joy for me to be here this evening as you folks begin the, the, another missions conference. You'll, you're working on deciding what your missions budget is going to be for the next year, the next fiscal missions year, and that's important. Uh, I don't know about your church, and I know a lot, not quite a bit about this church. I've been in a lot of mission conferences here. And in our church down in, in West Carrollton, Ohio, the mission conference is the biggest, the biggest thing of the year. Yep. Because realistically, that's what we're here for. And it's an exciting thing to be here <clears throat> and to uh, participate again. Thank you, preacher, for allowing me the, the use of your pulpit again. Uh, you and I have known each other for a long, long time. And, and I know you're fearful. You're probably trembling at what this maniac might say again. But uh, it's a joy to be back here again. <clears throat> you got to be kind now. You got you to be kind. You and I, you and I aren't very kind. You know, we, it was, you know, have you ever done one of those spiritual gift tests? <laughs> I never showed up very well on kindness. Uh, I was in the negative numbers on mercy, <laughs> and you know all those type things. But anyway, it's, it's exciting. Turn if you would to Exodus chapter uh, thirty. Let's see, 30, where are we going here? Um, <clears throat> yeah, just wait a minute. 36, I think. Is it 36? Yeah, 36. I get confused in my numbers here. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 36. I've, I've known missionaries for years and years and years. I was a little Sunday school kid, and I've seen missionaries and listened to them for every country where there ever were missionaries. And it always amazes me, the older missionaries, they always seem to go to the Old Testament. I think, what is the matter with these guys? Man, you know, the New Testament's where it's at. <clears throat> but we always go to the Old Testament, kind of freaky type people, you know, old missionaries and stuff. I think last time I was here, I told you missionaries are weird anyway. <clears throat> and we are, and we'll continue to be. And, and you may tell you something about missionaries. Missionaries are weird because the people we deal with is, are weird. Some of the weirdest missionaries you'll ever meet in your life are missionaries who go to Australia, New Zealand, and England because the English people, they're weird. You know, they, they, they eat tea by the spot. I knew you'd get a kick out of that. I knew you'd get a kick out of that. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 36. <clears throat> the, the first meeting of a mission conference is critically important. <clears throat> And I want to kind of set the stage. I want you, I want you to, to begin working in your heart. <clears throat> I want God to begin working in your heart to set the stage for what's going to happen during this conference. You know, you, you have noticed, <clears throat> and you're probably noticing even more, that uh, we have too much gray hair on the mission field. Yeah. Yeah. Realistically, and we have to, frankly, we have too much hair in the pulpit. We've, we're seriously, we're, we, we've, we're somehow we've, we're messing up. We need, we need new Timothys. And I'll be talking about that probably on Friday night. <clears throat> so ponder this thought about Timothy. But tonight we're going to speak about something different. Exodus chapter 36. It's, for me, it's a joy to put down the Spanish sword. I've preached out of for 41, almost, well, really 42 years now. And pick up an English one. You know, this is the one that, you know, you, that we grew up with, the, the English, and it's very, very special. Have you ever wondered why in the Old Testament they got these crazy names? <clears throat> We're going to see a guy named here. Uh, my problem is with, with Spanish, having preached in Spanish for so long, I almost always pronounce the Old Testament names the way we'd say them in Spanish. I don't want to butcher their names like that, so we're just going to change their names like I know a preacher that he used to do that a lot. <clears throat> in verse 1, we got a guy that starts with B, Bezalel in Spanish, and a buddy of his named Oholiab. We're going to call him Bob and Adam. <clears throat> I don't think we're doing damage to the, to the King James, but it's just so much simpler and I can think better. And once I, when I lose my train of thought, I'm in trouble. So we're going to, we're going to call them Bob and Adam. <clears throat> Watch what we find here. And, you know, always before you read the Bible, you need to pray. Let's pray real quick. One, two. <clears throat> Lord, it's been a busy day. Each of us, even down to the youngest, have been occupied in things. This is a time when we, we kind <clears> of <throat> settle down, open the Bible, and say, okay, God, what are you going to do with me? I pray that our time in this book would be blessed and blessed this evening. 
I pray that our hearts will be open. I pray that we would all be interested in getting something and picking something up this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Watch what we find here, Exodus chapter 36. Let me, let me give you just a little bit of background. You know, sometimes you, jump, you, get, you get these guys that jump into an Old Testament story, and I can't remember all the details. <clears throat> you remember the, the God of heaven had been doing some tremendous things with the Israelites. Some of you kids will remember that God took, them out, God took the Israelites out of Egypt and he, he opened some kind of a, a sea. What was the color of that sea, you remember? The Red Sea. He opened it up and they walked across on dry land. You remember all this, how the story goes. And they got up there and Moses went up. They were over in, 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 um, in, on the peninsula, uh, Saudi Arabia, not Arabia, they called it back then. And they went up on this big mountain and he got these... He got these uh, he picked up these 10 things and they were, they, were, they were written on stone. What were those called? The 10 something? What were those? The, the 10 commandments. Well, you got some smart kids here. The 10 commandments. But you remember what those people, those Israelites did when he was up there? They built something while he was up there. What was it? It was a golden calf. Now, let me ask you a question. Where did they get the gold? Huh? Yes, from the Egyptians. God said, listen, go to your neighbors. Get all, the, get, all the, get all the gold you can get. And what they do with it? Not all of it, thank God. But they took the gold that they had taken from the Egyptians and they built a golden calf, which was an idol. And they shouldn't have done that. Matter of fact, when Moses came down off the mountain, I don't know if I should say this, he was ticked off. He was upset. He was mad to such a degree that you know what he said? You know what he told those people to do with that? You grind that, you'd grind that golden calf up and you eat it. Mm -hmm. And is that true? Yes. Yeah. Now let me tell you something. If I was into hunting gold, I wouldn't be go I wouldn't be going preacher to Sutter's Mill out there in California where they, they discovered gold in 1848, I think it was, or 49, whenever that was. I'd go dig the septic tanks of Saudi Arabia. There's gold there. <clears throat> God brought them out with gold and all kind of precious things for a purpose. Watch what we find here. Then wrought Bob and Adam... And every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bob and Adam and every wise-hearted man in whose heart. Notice he said that twice. Every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come into the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering, which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it with all. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men, again, that wrought all the work of the sanctuary, came every man from his work which they had made. And they spoke unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, let neither man nor woman make any more, any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. You know, that's where we are in this giving by faith. This is exactly where we are in this giving by faith. God has given us enough to do what we're supposed to do. But what do we do with it? Sometimes we make golden calves out of it. We do exactly what we're not supposed to do, what God's already placed through us. You remember there, your pastors preached this for years and you've heard it. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, in the, especially during the mission conference. You know, there are three basic offerings in the church. And obviously we have special offerings when, uh, you know, Widow Jones' house burns down, we take up a special offering. That's a different thing. Three basic offerings. There's the, the tithe. And there's the building fund, and there's missions. Now, you know, each one of those have different, a different thrust behind them and a different reason for doing them. Why do we tithe? <coughs> to me, a man would be a fool not to tithe. 
Edie and I have done it for years and years and years. We did it, before, we did it even before we got married. And we found, we found God to be true, and we live better on 90% with God's blessing than we would on the 100% without his blessing. Amen. We give, but what is that? That's because we're obedient. Obedience is required for tithe. Let me mention something. You know, I, I, I shoot straight with you. You know me. I, you've known me for years, and this is what I tell you. Don't get ticked off at your preacher and take your missions, or your, I should say your tithe money, and give it to missions. What would they call that in legal terms? That's misappropriation of funds. That is illegal. In the business world, you go to jail for doing that. And then you do that, and then you send that money to me? Do not send me stolen money. No, you, you tithe, yes, because your tithe is, for, tithe is to pay your light bill, to pay your pastor. Your tithe is for your church. You're robbing yourselves when you essentially give your tithe to missions. But then there's the building. You know, when the tornado comes by and takes the roof off, what do you have to do? You have to dig deep. We're going to have to sacrifice to do this. Because the building fund is done by sacrifice. We sacrifice to have a nice home. We sacrifice to build a big garage. We sacrifice to run our, our fancy cars and Corvettes, you know, and our toys. <clears throat> and we, we sacrifice to, to, to build this nice building. That's sacrificial. You know what? <clears throat> Missions offering isn't meant to be sacrificial. Yes, sacrifice is involved, but it's not meant to be sacrificial. The missions offering is meant to be by faith. Yeah. Because faith is the only, listen to me, faith is the only way that we can connect with God. The same God who has all the gold of the Egyptians, it's all in his pocket. He owns it all. And he has a way of making us, of bringing it to us so that we can use it for the work, just like we find here. But I want to show you something. <clears throat> now, we, you, you notice that I mentioned uh, when we talked about wise-hearted people, it's mentioned three times they were wise. But there's something, not just that, that they were wise, there's something else in verse 2. Watch what you find here. Watch this again. And the Lord called Bob and Adam and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come into the work to do it. They were stirred up. Yeah. Now, now I, you know, I'm just a truck driver's kid from Indiana. And I can't, so I can't think all these heavy theological things like these other people with the Tennessee Temple and all these fancy schools. I don't know all those fancy details and all the, the religious stuff. All I know is this. To stir something up, what do you have to have? A spoon. Let me tell you a story about a spoon. I preached for years in the home, a very humble home of an, an old lady near Capos, which is on the Pacific port of, or side of Costa Rica. You get on a bus, and, and I used to for years, and you go, on, you go, and that's where young preacher boys in Costa Rica cut their teeth by going with me. And we'd go 14 kilometers into where the base of the mountain, and we'd preach in this old lady's home. Her name was Jovita. And she would fix me. <clears throat> she, would, well, I would, she was very kind to me. She became like my mother. She's in heaven now. Interesting story. She's buried in the cemetery in Capos. She would fix me something to eat almost every time I would go there. And she had a very, her home was um, cow high. It was, it was on stilts, and it was cow high. That means the, the, underneath the house is where she kept her cow. So it didn't have to be 10 feet up, you know, because cows aren't 10 feet tall. So it, her house was cow high. And in her kitchen, she had, obviously, she had this little, little it was a little table of rough hewn wood, uh, about the size of your, your communion table here. <clears throat> and above it, she kept a little uh, cage with a white rat in it. I don't have time. Time doesn't allow me to tell you what the right, white rat's for. You have to ask me later. <clears throat> she had a white rat, but she would fix me, she would fix me green bean omelet sometimes. Have you ever eaten a green bean omelet? Fabulous. One day I was there, and I'd eaten, and she fixed me a drink, which was kind. And I watched her fix it. I, could, I didn't know what it was, and that gets to be scary. You know, they tell missionaries, 
And when you're a missionary, they give you food. I've eaten armadillo twice. Armadillo is like a, a possum on a half shell. <clears throat> so, but, but you just eat it. You know, they give you something to eat and you just eat it and you just trust God. God will get me through this. <clears throat> Same thing with drinks. They, bring, they, they, they drink whatever the trees are growing at the time. Well, she brought me this drink. I had no idea what it was, and I saw her build this drink. It was in a glass glass about that tall, clear glass, so, so you could see in it. And it was white, so it had to have milk in it. <clears throat> and she put these things in, uh, this stuff, and she stirred it. <clears throat> she had a spoon, and she was stirring this thing. And she stirred it, and she stirred it, and I mean, it was going around like a tornado. And she brought it to me. I was sitting at the table, this rough-hewn table, and I was sitting, and I thought, oh, God, help me. What is this? I had no, I had no idea what it was. And I looked at it, and it was still stirring, and there was, there was spots in it, but I didn't see ants, which, which told me something important. It told me that it didn't have a lot of sugar. Because out in the country, if you've got sugar, ants are in it. We have ants in Costa Rica. They, the, you know what Tupperware is? They get in Tupperware. I mean, tell you, they're, 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 if, and, but I didn't see ants, so I knew it didn't have much sugar, and I thought, well, at least it could have been sweet. What's the matter? Come on, Jovita. <clears throat> she handed me this thing, and I hadn't been to Costa Rica very long, so I, I, was, I was sitting there like this, you know, and I put this glass on my knee, and I thought, well, you know what? The longer I talk, the more of this is going to settle down. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and it settled probably when I when I put it on the on the table and kind of graciously got out. I drank off the top, all the liquid on the top. There was probably an inch, inch and a quarter of stuff in the bottom. But I noticed you know, it wasn't that bad of a flavor. It wasn't that bad, but I had still had no idea what it was. I found out later. No, it's not. It's not. This is serious. And today it's my favorite natural, uh, favorite drink. Of the, you know, I like Coca-Cola better than anything. It's better than milk. <clears throat> but this is my favorite drink. If you're out mowing the yard and you're all hot and sweaty and you come in and you drink this stuff, it will settle you right. It'll, it'll cool you off. And you know what it is? You take a glass of milk, take a third of it, and you boil it with cinnamon. And then you take powdered oatmeal, and while that's cooking and boiling... You take the powdered oatmeal and put it in the other part, stir it up real good, and then mix them, stir it up really, really, really good, and you kill that thing, and it'll cool you right off. It is fabulous. But I didn't know. I didn't think to say, Hovi, to give me this spoon, because I didn't know what was in it. Hovi, to give me the spoon. That after that time, once I found out what it was, you know what I asked for? The spoon. You ever had a spoon? You ever had a spiritual spoon? You say, God, stir me up. Would you take my heart, God? Would you take my heart and stir it up? Like it was when you were 22 years old in the preacher's office and you get saved. First thing that comes to your mind is my mom, my dad, my uncle, my neighbor. They're going to hell. They've got to hear this message. We were stirred up when we first got saved. But then you know what we do? We settle in. And we settle in. And the longer the time passes, the more we settle in. And it's not very long until the best that we have, which is our own testimony of our own salvation, it gets sunk down to the bottom and it doesn't, we're not stirred up anymore. Would you let God stir you up? Would you let God in this meeting, would you let him stir you up? So he can take the best ingredients that he's placed in you and stir you up so that you're ready to serve him. I don't know what that would require. All I know is this, is they were wise. You know what wisdom is? How, where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from the fear of God. The fear, fear doesn't mean, you know what's being scared of the dark and scared of spider. You probably, you probably, what's the biggest spider you've ever seen? Now, I don't know the same thing as Spider-Man. I'm not talking about that. The biggest spider I've ever seen, his body, you know how spiders have a big fat body and then a little head? The, big, uh, the biggest one I've seen, his body was as big as my fist. Now, that's scary. 
But now I'm talking about that kind of scary. I'm talking about the fear of the Lord is, is really what it is, is putting him in his place in your life. You respect him to such a degree. He's my God. You know, we've never had a king. Thank God sometimes, you know, who'd want a king like the English people have kings? You know, these people are freaky. We've never had a king. But do you know what, you know what kings can do? King, can, king has a son. His son is 18, 20, 25 years old. And he, and he, he comes to your, your um, I'll, I'll use you young lady, uh, Mrs. Klein, Miss Klein, is that your name? They come to your dad's house, and you know what they would say? The king would say, listen, my son is of marrying age, and I want her, I want your daughter to be his wife. And what would you have to say? Yes, sir. She's yours. And you know why? Because she already belongs to him. He's the king. He owns everything. That's what God is. That's, that's how it is with God. God owns us. But you know what we do? We let it all settle in. Tonight, I want to I want to challenge you with this thought. <clears throat> Would you ask God to give you a spoon? That's a dumb illustration. I know, but this is, this is I'm a truck driver's kid from Indiana. This is the only way I can think. Would you say, God, give me a spoon, stir me up, so that I can think about what this, this is, what this mission conference is going to do? What what is it going to involve in my life? How would it change the way I give to missions? How would it involve and change my level of faith? God, would you give me a spoon so that I can grow in faith during this conference? I would sure hope that you would. You have to be wise. You have to know who you are. You have to know what you're here for and the purpose that God has for your life. And then you'd be surprised what would happen. And what was their result? Remember the last verse we read? What did it say? We close with this thought. It said this. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. Amen. They gave from what they had. They were wise in doing so. And they were stirred up. Would you be stirred up tonight? I wish I'd have told Jovita that first time. Give me a spoon, Jovita. But I learned a hard lesson. And I said, Jovita, every time from after that, Jovita, can I borrow your spoon? Now, let me, let me share another story, and then I'll close with this. Years back, <clears throat> I preached in a little place called, uh, right outside the town of Guapilis. A family had gotten saved out, in, out on the Pacific coast, and they moved to the Atlantic coast, and I was responsible for them. There was no church in their area. So I had to go, and I preached to them on Sundays for nine months in a row. The dad and the son had to get, they, well, not that they had to get baptized. They were going to get baptized. We, we dammed up the creek so we could have enough water to baptize them. Yeah, you know, when, uh, baptizing in a fast-flowing river is different. They never taught us how to do that in Bible college. That's, that's a whole other challenge. But baptizing with just a little bit of water is another ballgame. Because you've got to get them all underwater. You know, if we're a good, good Baptist, you've got to get them all underwater. They, too, before I would leave, it was a four-hour trip out there. I'd preach and then four hours back. And they would feed me before I left. That, by the way, was the second place I ate armadillo. And I think it, had been, it was roadkill, and I think it had been in the road too long. <clears throat> But you know what? Every time they fed me, see, it was a mom, a dad, two children, and me, that's five. But we never ate. For nine months, I visited their home like this, and for never did we eat more than three at a time. And it took me a while to figure out why. The, I mean, we're talking, these are, these are people, the country people. We're living in a, in a ranch. <clears throat> they had one knife. And three spoons. That's all they had. Do you have a spoon? Would you ask God tonight, God, give me a spoon? I want to be stirred up, God. I want to do my part. 
so that it can get to, get to the place where, hey, what we got sufficient. It can, it can be done with Bibles, with preachers that will go, young people that would surrender their lives. You'd be surprised what can, be hap- what, what can happen. But you got to get stirred up. Would you do that tonight? Would you, would, you, would you commit to getting stirred up? Would you say, not Hovita? Would you say, not Bob and not Adam, not Moses? Would you say, God, stir me up? Let's pray. Probably before, let me ask you a question before, before we pray. How long has it been since you've been stirred up? 